Hi, my name is Andrew Knight. I'm here to talk to you today about algorithmic consciousness, whether or not it's possible, and specifically why mind uploading and conscious computers are impossible in principle. I have a master's degree in nuclear engineering from MIT and a law degree from Georgetown and have just begun a graduate physics program at NYU. So let me start with the fundamental problems. The first problem is an assumption that's made, and I suspect by most members of the audience of this concurrent session on AI and machine consciousness uh, probably uh, share this assumption, that mind uploading and brain copying are essentially technological questions, that they're possible in principle, it's just a matter of time, uh, but there's no physical reason why they're not possible. So, Interestingly, if you do a Google search of the phrase, copy the brain, um, you get about a million potential results. A lot of them are copies. Most of them are copies of various uh, other entries. But the point is, there's lots. Um, whereas if you instead search for uh, the phrase, impossible to copy the brain, um, it yields just one, and that is my blog uh, in which um, I discuss the possibility of brain copying. And so that might give you an idea of how embedded the assumption is in the scientific community that it is inherently possible to copy the brain. Some of the problems that result from the assumed copyability of conscious states and the brain um, is, uh, well, there's lots of them, but one of them is the uh, duplication or teleportation uh, uh, concept or problem. Um, Penrose discusses this. I'll, I'll mention this in uh, a list of references at the end of this presentation. But it's essentially the notion that what happens um, if somebody could, um, you know, on, on the planet Mars, duplicate your brain or your body or whatever it is that instantiates your consciousness, uh, and back on Earth they're supposed to euthanize or destroy the existing copy. Um, this um, would seem like it would, it would result in a, an instantaneous teleportation of you, your awareness, to Mars. Um, but what happens if the person back on Earth responsible for destroying the original copy of you uh, was napping on the job and didn't do so? Uh, what, what would it feel like then to have those um, multiple instantiations of your consciousness or your awareness? Uh, another problem is the simulation problem. Uh, Bostrom gives an idea of, um, of, of what would happen if uh, consciousness uh, could be simulated. And, and the idea is that it's very expensive uh, in terms of materials and energy to actually create uh, a single person having conscious awareness. Um, but it's very easy to make copies of software. So if um, it were possible to simulate consciousness, um, then we would expect there to be essentially infinitely many more simulations than actual versions, which would mean that probabilistically uh, you are indeed a simulation. Uh, it's kind of, kind of weird. Uh, another problem is the uh, self-location uh, by uh, mentioned by Adam Elga. It's very similar to the movie Multiplicity, where um, uh, he wakes up from this operation and doesn't realize um, which version of him he is. And then another version, another problem is um, the Boltzmann brain problem, um, which uh, Sean Carroll um, discusses. And it's just the notion that um, it's far more likely that um, a, a random quantum um, version has um, just uh, accidentally fluctuated into existence um, than um, the idea that an actual um, entire world or, or solar system or galaxy has instantiated, has, has fluctuated into existence. Um, and so it's very similar to the problem of simulation in the sense that um, any given instance of a, um, of a conscious person is far, far, far more likely to be just a random blip than to be the real thing. So these are just a few of the problems um, that um, would be true if it were possible for conscious states to be copied. And so here's what I essentially want to know. Um, is it possible? Um, and, and I'm going to um, express it in the first person. I want to know, is it possible to upload me 
to a computer. Um, you know, somebody may say that um, they've succeeded in uploading someone else to a computer, um, but I can't necessarily distinguish um, the real person um, from the simulation on a computer. Um, they may both pass a Turing test, um, but what I want to know is whether or not um, a, a, a scientist could, uh, in fact, upload me to a computer, and what would that feel like? Um, again, uh, is it possible to teleport me to another galaxy um, by the uh, duplication or teleportation? Uh, so I'm going to address these uh, questions in terms of uh, the possibilities due to special relativity, but I'm going to start with a number of assumptions. The first one is supervenience. A conscious state, C1, supervenes on a physical state, S1. And what I mean by that is that instantiation of that physical state, S1, is sufficient, it is adequate to create conscious state C1 of a person having an identity. Now, when I say a physical state, I'm not limiting myself to quantum states, classical states, or anything else. I'm just being very broad and saying there's something physical about the universe whether it's localized or not, that is sufficient to create that conscious state C1. So, for example, here is, uh, here's Einstein, and the question is, what does it take physically to create Einstein's conscious awareness at that moment? Would it be enough to uh, instantiate his head or his brain and those neural connections, etc. cetera. Uh, it, maybe that's not enough. Maybe we need something more, maybe more of his body or things around him. Uh, maybe it's bigger than that. It, it's kind of irrelevant. The point is, supervenience just assumes that consciousness arises, consciousness having an identity, which I'll discuss later, arises due to some fundamental underlying physical state. And then the second assumption I'll make is that, well, that physical state can be copied. It's, it, it's pretty simple. Either it can be copied or it can't. And what I mean by copyability is that, uh, specifically, it can be copied or repeated in a way that does not prevent other copies or instantiations from evolving. A and so um, we'll see later that there may be a relationship to quantum no cloning. So to say this colloquially, in the first person, really what I mean is, really what I'm assuming is that there is some physical state that can be copied that would cause me to experience, to consciously experience that physical state. And then I'm going to now analyze these two assumptions through special relativity. So I'll only have time today to look at space-like separated instances but this will give you a good flavor. So let's start with some uh, initial conscious state C1 that, of course, is assumed to be produced by some underlying physical state, say, S1. What I'm going to do is um, I'm going to uh, essentially destroy this conscious state, uh, but copy the information so that I can then make other copies elsewhere. But the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a light cone, and of course, um, uh, inside here is time-like, and then outside is space-like, so that within here there are temporal relationships relative to this event. Outside here there are not temporal relationships relative to this event. So what happens now if I um, now instantiate that underlying physical state so that I create that conscious state C1 downstream in space-time? And then I allow it to then just evolve naturally uh, as it interacts with its surroundings. And um, that happens to result in a, an evolution to some conscious state C2. Now, we don't have to talk about streams of consciousness that may not even exist. I'm just suggesting um, that um, um, at, there, there's some conscious state uh, here, and there's a later conscious state here. And there's this just, just some natural physical evolution. Now, um, it seems clear to me, well, not seems clear, it's actually it logically follows from those two assumptions 
um, that um, whatever um, the person was experiencing at this moment now experiences here. That's what it means. That's what supervenience uh, in my definition means. So it's the same person who experiences um, from here, sort of maybe a blip, um, you know, I, I don't know what that would feel like, but um, it's the same person having the same experience here, and that person then experiences some progression to conscious state C2. Now, what happens if, um, of course, by copyability, uh, oh, I'm sorry, th these, this is the light cone of this event, uh, this instantiation here. So what happens um, if we now instantiate a second copy? Uh, elsewhere in uh, space-time, such that um, uh, this is the light cone of, of this event, and so uh, these two events are space-like to each other. Well, let's say that it naturally evolves to the same conscious state C2. Well, there doesn't seem to be any problem here. Um, the person seems to experience whatever it's like to go from conscious state C1 to C2. It doesn't really matter how it's done because they're exactly the same. But the problem arises now when, um, due to some completely uh, random event, it could be a quantum event, um, that's this instantiation over here of C1 actually evolves to some different state, not C2, but rather some, say, C2 prime. And now the question comes, what does that person actually experience? Well, there's only three possibilities. Either that person doesn't experience anything, uh, in either one of those, both of them, or one or the other. Those are the only three uh, logical possibilities. So consider neither. Now the problem is we've already, um, it, it already follows logically from supervenience and copability that whatever the person was experiencing here, that person experiences here. Or, or let's, say, let's say right here. Uh, and so that must mean that the person cannot experience neither because we already know that the pe person experiences uh, at least one of these. So it can't be neither. Now, what about, what does it feel like to experience both uh, paths or streams uh, or evolutions of consciousness? Well, the problem is that um, whatever conscious state uh, is experienced here and here depends on the underlying uh, physical state, which means that um, whatever um, a person is experiencing this evolution of consciousness cannot experience whatever evolution is causing this stream of consciousness because they're space-like separated. So if that conscious state depends on that underlying physical state, then um, this person um, cannot experience what's happening here without violating the locality of special relativity. So it can't be both of them. Now what about, okay, so maybe just the answer is just one or the other. Well, the problem there, and you might say, okay, so maybe um, nature just determines, you know, whatever's closest um, to uh, the original event is the one that gets selected. Uh, but the problem is nature can't, um, can't do so because we've already assumed that the required information to produce state C1 is already um, uh, adequately held in underlying physical state S1. So there can't be additional information to distinguish these two. And further, they're space-like separated. So there's no way, even if that were the case, uh, for um, this to somehow send a signal to say, all right, this is the person, not this person over here. Uh, so uh, there's nothing to prevent both of those space-like instantiations from um, ultimately being uh, experienced by the person. So it can't be any of these, uh, and therefore we have a contradiction when it comes to space-like separated instances. Now it turns out you can do uh, a nearly identical analysis for time-like separated instances I don't have time because uh, I'm limited uh, it, during this, uh, but nevertheless, it is described clearly in my paper that I'll reference at the end of this presentation. But at the end of the day, there's a very similar analysis for time-like separated instances. So what you end up getting is a contradiction 
by special relativity so that we can conclude that copyability is false. Now, supervenience itself may or may not be true, or may or may not be false, because copyability implies supervenience. So if this is false, then that doesn't really tell us anything about this. But that's okay, because all I cared about was whether or not it was possible to copy a physical state to produce me elsewhere. And the answer is, it's not, because copyability is false. Therefore, a conscious state cannot be copied or repeated unless something about the universe prevents those copies from evolving different, differently. Or said more simply, there is no physical state that can be copied that would cause me to experience that physical state. Now why? why? What might be a physical explanation? Well again, I'm limited on time here, so I'll go through these very quickly. Uh, one possibility um, is that, or one hypothesis, is that it is simply impossible to adequately measure some underlying physical state, S1, that produces a conscious state, C1. And it could be because uh, the information is already zooming away at the speed of light, or because uh, measuring it would collapse a wave function if, in fact, uh, you know, quantum mechanics uh, is um, nonlinear. It might be because the information can't be measured with adequate precision, there's quantum uncertainty, etc. Another hypothesis is, well, okay, maybe in principle it would be possible to adequately measure the physical state, but it doesn't matter because you can't create it anyway, and I, this may be because of quantum entanglements or correlations with particles that are zooming away at the speed of light. Uh, maybe uh, state S1 is just simply too big. It could be because the state S1 is history dependent. That's something that I'm currently working on in one of my papers. I'm not sure what the correct answer is, but it is interesting to note, I will just mention as an aside, that the only known physical mechanism that prevents the existence of multiple copies of the same entity is quantum no cloning. So this may suggest independently some relationship between consciousness and quantum mechanics. I don't want to go down that route, but it is interesting that uh, this does seem to um, relate to uh, quantum no cloning. And so one thing I can conclude then from the fact that copyability is false is that consciousness is not algorithmic. Why is that? Well, an algorithm is nothing more than software. It's nothing more than a deterministic set of instructions that converts input to output. It's easily copied by its nature. It can be reset on the same computer, or it can be, uh, lots of different copies can be executed on lots of different general purpose computers at different places in space time. So you make lots of instantiations of them, that's not a problem. Well, but if a conscious state cannot be copied or repeated, but an algorithm can, well, then that seems to imply that an algorithm cannot itself produce a conscious state. Therefore, consciousness cannot be algorithmic. And then from that, of course, flows that mind uploading, brain copying, and conscious computers are all fundamentally, in principle, impossible. Now, given the audience here, people who uh, very likely already believe that machines can be conscious, it's just a technological limitation, uh, you'll likely have lots of objections. And I address these objections in my paper and also on my blog. But there's one that stands out, one that always comes at me, and one that uh, you almost certainly are thinking of right now. And it's probably got nothing to do with quantum mechanics or relativity. It probably has to do with the nature of identity. So the way this objection typically goes is something like this. Well, how do you know that two instances of the same physical state, S1, or even the same conscious state, C1, how do you know that they're the same person having the same identity? And so uh, this, to use the philosopher's lexicon, this is stating that two physical copies are not numerically identical. Okay. Here's the thing. If that's true, 
If it's true that two instances of the same physical or conscious state aren't the same person having the same identity, then that means there's nothing to copy. There's no physical state to copy that would produce the same conscious state of the same person. And we've gotten to the conclusion of non-copyability. But if it's false, of course, then I've just shown that special relativity makes it impossible to copy a physical state that produces the conscious state of a person. So either way, copyability is false. Now, the same objection could be said a different way. It could be said like this. Well, my definition of supervenience is false. Supervenience generally just means that, in, in this context, just means that a conscious state depends on an underlying physical state. But I've added something here, you probably noticed, um, that um, the instantiation of physical state S1 is sufficient to create a conscious state of a person having an identity. So um, you might just say, oh, well, that's, that's, just, that's just false. There's, there, there, there is no identity, or, or it's not the same identity, or something like that. Well, it's absolutely irrelevant for the exact same reason that I, I just uh, mentioned in the earlier objection, which is the same objection. It's irrelevant. Because if um, supervenience, my definition of supervenience is false, then also my definition of copyability is false because that copyability uh, depended on the initial supervenience. In other words, if my definition of supervenience is false, well, once again, there's nothing to copy that's going to copy that same person having that same identity. And that's the thing that I'm, I'm concerned about for, for me. And every conscious person, if you're conscious, you should be concerned about for you. Um, not so much whether you can create, whether um, other people are conscious or other conscious states can be copied, but whether you could be uploaded to a computer or you could be duplicated, just as I'm concerned about whether I could be du duplicated. But if there's nothing physical to copy that would copy me and my identity, well, then it's not possible and there's nothing to worry about at that point. So in other words, if supervenience is false, so is copyability. But if supervenience is true, then I've just shown through special relativity that copyability is still false. So either way, copyability is false and ultimately, it means that uh, there's nothing that can be copied that would produce me elsewhere in a conscious state. So thank you for listening. There is a much deeper analysis, especially regarding the, the most typical objections regarding identity, uh, in this paper that you can find on the archive and which is now under consideration by a journal. I'm very interested in your questions and your comments and your feedback, and I can be reached at uh, this email address. And then finally, here are a few resources that I referenced in the talk. So thank you again for your time.